Thank you, Aaron. And thank you all for, um, well, thank you both for inviting me, um, but all, all of you for traveling and coming to listen to us. Um, so today I'll be very brief, but I'll just, uh, in order, and I think most of you know all of this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, I'll be defining ecosystems, and then defining ecosystem services, and I'll go over a list of ecosystem services um, and then how they are classified or categorized and then uh, what is their relationship to biodiversity and then the remainder of the course is what metrics are out there um, that are reliable to um, measure um, what, what kind of ecosystem services we have. Um, so as you probably know, um, an ecosystem is an assemblage of organisms together with their physical and chemical environments. Um, so examples of um, ecosystems um, include a pond, a forest, an estuary, a grassland. And all of these have abiotic, you know, the temperature, wind characteristics at that place, soil characteristics, and the biotic uh, components, the decomposers, primary producers, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those interact at a, at a you know, locale um, that's more or less bounded, um, and they'll, um, they in all these um, components interact and they have both structure and function. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, if we think of a forest ecosystem, what do forest ecosystem provide us, humans, um, in our daily lives? <coughs> Yes. Uh, can you speak up? Fresh air. fresh air, fantastic. What else? Yes. Raw materials. Raw materials, fantastic. To build our homes and to, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. To uh, build, uh, build our homes and to, uh, uh, for firewood sometimes, et cetera, et cetera. What else? Deborah? There's this like, Attract rain. Attract rain. Okay, so uh, montane forest rainfall, yes. Um, bush meat. Bush meat, yeah, yeah, so it provides. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> what else? Um, uh, prudence. Habitat. Patience. Yes. Habitat, yeah, for other species, Animals. but even ourselves. Um, Franklin. And uh, sometime during war. Uh, a forest may help us to have a refugee place. <laughs> and this may be an ecosystem service that without forest, maybe it can be dramatic. Yeah, I, um, I didn't have that one on my list, but I, it's a good one. It's a good one. Okay. So um, most of you have already, you know, we, we've talked about most of those. Um, so yeah. we missed a couple. So we've got fiber. Um, so forest will provide um, paper and products and derived from that. Um, they'll also help infiltrate water. So capture water on all those leaves, et cetera, in the trunk and just slow down the um, time it takes for water um, to get to the surface and then infiltrate or even, even if it runs off, it's, it's, it, it slows that down. Um, the, obviously there's nutrient cycling, ecosystem energetics, um, CO2 uptake, um, O2 release, climate stability, as Ida will talk about extensively in a couple of days. Most of you said, you know, there's obviously lots of habitat and biodiversity. Um, also, there are food, pr food products within forests and um, a lot of recreation, mental, and, and um, social health impacts. And refuge from war. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to add that and then I'll tell my students um, who said it and, and, and why. Um, so that brings us, so you know, um, those were ecosystems um, and so essentially you already all know what ecosystem services are. It's those services that are provided by natural systems. So I like to define them 
as the ben benefits we derive from nature and to point out that these benefits are provided for free. And that's the important point, right? Um, they are a very anthropocentric concept, right? It's benefits for humans um, and so that, that you know, has been uh, controversial for some people, but um, for others it's really helped the conversation as to why we should preserve ecosystems. Um, it's just since they provide humans with these services for free, we have, um, it, it's in our inherent best interest to conserve them. Um, they're also oftentimes referred to as the human life support system. Um, and rightly so. Here are um, some ecosystem services, so obviously food production, slope stability, uh, fire prevention, fire, uh, fiber production, pollination's a big one, carbon sequestration's a big one, and both of these um, you'll get um, more intense training on how to try and quantify them. Biodiversity's another one, flood protection, recreation, tourists, tourism, water purification, stabilizing microclimate, etc. Those are some major ecosystem services. So um, I also downloaded from Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> yes. Can I ask you? Please. I can see that all those services are described in function of what human can get. Yes. Can we talk about ecosystem services for wild, like animals? So I would think so for sure, but as they were um, intended, ecosystem services are for humans. Yeah. Um, it's just the way, I think it's just the history of how they came about. But it's for sure that anytime you're preserving an ecosystem, with the goal of having those ecosystem services for humans, you're also providing benefits for the wildlife um, that live in those ecosystems. So it's, it's a derived benefit and it's a po an important one, but maybe not the focus because this is such an anthropocentric concept. I answer your question. Um, yeah, so you can see on this, well you probably can't read it, but you'll have it in the slides when we post them in drop, Dropbox, that there are many other ecosystem services. Um, and then you can add your own uh, up here in Wikipedia if you'd like. I push the edit button. Uh, so, so what I, I want you to know though is that there are often, these ecosystem services are often classified um, into four categories. Um, and those are provisioning services, regulating services, cultural services, and supporting services. So the provisioning services usually make um, the most sense to people. It's those goods, those products, um, that you derive, you know, from the natural forest, from the ocean. Um, so the, f the fuel, you know, the, the, the firewood that you come from the forest that, that might provide fuel or fiber. Um, obviously fresh water is a big um, provisioning ecosystem service. Um, some ecosystem services that, that people uh, think of less often are the supporting, regulating, and cultural. So uh, the regulating ones, um, the ones that get put under the regulating categories, as the name implies, are those that will regulate flood or disease or waste. Um, and so um, anything that provides water purification, flood regulation um, and, and mitigates um, climate change would fall under um, this category. The cultural uh, ecosystem services I think are the toughest to measure, um, but they are some that, that can um, be easy to talk about with other people. And so in particular, you know, um, green space, so-called green spaces will provide for educational um, services. You can bring children and adults out there and tell them about the natural world and about um, ecosystems. But oftentimes uh, the important one, um, at least in the US and Europe, is recreational services, so going out 
and experiencing these ecosystem services um, in their quote unquote natural state. Um, and there are all, uh, also quite a few aesthetic, just the, be just the beauty of uh, a place like town was mentioning with the national parks in the US you know why were they there well because people found the mountains beautiful well that does have um, that that is an ecosystem services and oftentimes uh, different places will have different spiritual meanings to people and that too is an ecosystem service um, all of these services are supported or are only possible because of another suite of services that um, that these depend on. So the supporting ecosystem services such as nutrient cycling, soil formation, primary production are necessary ecosystem services for all of these other ones to, um, to exist. Now, why do we um, care about these ecosystem services? Well, again, when you're thinking just about humans and their well-being, there are rather direct connections between many of these ecosystem services and these um, what, what the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment calls as constituents of well-being. Um, so obviously, if you have enough food and uh, and you have uh, you know sh shelter um, and uh, livelihoods that you know um, provide you with enough income for you and your family uh, to be secure, then and and the, all of those things come from um, particular <coughs> ecosystem services um, that makes your life better. Um, that's obviously a a, a, a pro. Um, some of the links are weaker, um, that, those are delineated by the width of the arrow, but they're still present and, and we, we should talk about them. Um, yeah. Uh, ooh, yeah. So you may notice that around this um, box that has all these ecosystem services um, in their categories, there's another box that encompasses the whole thing. And that box is called the biodiversity box. And that's why we're here today, right? Or the, these two weeks. Um, and so why do you think on this diagram that's in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, why do you think you have biodiversity as all encompassing of all these ecosystem services? What's the link? I think for the biodiversity to function, it has to have all the ecosystem functioning, you know, interlinking with each other for the process to function well. If one is missing, there has to be an alteration to the biodiversity. Okay, okay. And what about if you flip it too? <laughs> Anybody want to make that argument? Yeah. I want to make the argument that for ecosystems is the accumulation of many species all wow. acting in tandem. So that any change outside that creates a new balance that the reaction might f not provide, might not regulate, might not offer cultural values. Right, 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 right. So, so if you go back to the definition of ecosystems, it was that, that assemblage of organisms. And those organisms are what make up the biodiversity. If you lose biodiversity, then your ecosystem function changes and those services will change. And that's really key to everything we're doing in these next two weeks. Um, now there are many, so this is, a, um, this is a table that I found in Diaz et al. 2006. Um, and if you need the paper, just, I, I didn't put it in your readings, I forgot. Um, but just email me and I'll um, send it to you. But she has a, this really nice table, I think, and it's not, all-encompassing but um, it talks about it basically maps out for some ecosystem services how um, biodiversity affects um, those ecosystem services and I've highlighted just a couple um, just as examples but you should read this table on your own later or the entire paper um, but so obviously if you have genetic dis diversity then you'll, you'll have um, a more stable production of plants that are necessary for humans um, just in terms of food or things like that. 
Um, I like to think of biodiversity as the insurance policy um, for the planet. And so the more biodiversity you have, the more secure you are in the future in the face of change to withstand that change because there, there will be organisms that can fill um, gaps and there will be or organisms that are better suited for different climatic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And that gets at that. Um, she actually has a rather, well, she and her team have a rather um, broad view of biodiversity. They also think of um, biodiversity in terms of the diversity of land units. So the more land covers you have, or like, like Ben will, sh will um, show you um, when he does the LIDAR, the more 3D structure you have in a forest, the more biodiverse, um, you, the more biodiversity you would expect. Um, and she talks about how even the arrangement and the size of these land covers, um, which in landscape ecology is called heterogeneity of, of uh, land cover, um, Sorry, uh, am I moving too much too? No, okay. Um, will, I did mess up the screen though. There we go. Um, <laughs> will change the quantity and the quality of water availability in that landscape. Um, yeah, and I already talked about the last one. The last one is the traditional, you know, number of species um, as, as um, as a biodiversity measure. Um, so unfortunately, uh, primarily, you know, due to human domination of our planet, um, the uh, recent uh, rate of extinction is, is much greater than it was when you look at the fossil record. So uh, here on the x-axis is you have different um, you know, groups of species, marine species, mammals, mammals, birds, amphibians, all species. And then on the y-axis you have the number of um, extinctions per thousand species per millennium. So it's, it's the rate of extinction. Um, and so in, in the past, you could see we were about here, and then the recent past, like what, what we could call the present, um, the extinction rate is, is um, you know, 100 to 1,000 times higher than it was in uh, the fossil record. And then if we continue on the trajectory we have been on uh, with our modification of ecosystems um, and thus their services, um, the predictions by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment are that we will greatly increase even more um, this extinction rate. And already uh, 10 to 30 percent of mammal and bird and amphibian species um, are threatened with extinction. The main reason for this has been uh, our chain, our how we've modified ecosystems. Um, so uh, here uh, you have a graph where on the x-axis you have the proportion of the land area that has been converted from um, the biome it used to be to something else. Um, usually rangeland, usually agriculture, usually you know developed land. Um, and you, in um, orange um, were the losses by 1950, in red were the losses between 1950 and 1990, and the maroon are pro projected losses by 2050. And so you see by, that by 1950, the orange color, we had transformed much of these biomes already. Um, and then from 1950 to 1990, we've, we've added um, you know, we've, we've increased the proportion of land that we've covered, in some, that we've converted. Um, and in some cases, you know, almost up to um, three-thirds, th three three-thirds, two-thirds of, of that um, particular biome is expected to be converted um, by 2050, um, which is rather shocking. Um, and, and in case you're wondering about that one, that's about the reforestation of um, North America and Northern Europe. Um, but it is an, a, um, 
anomaly compared to uh, the, the other changes in all these other ecosystems. So what kinds of solutions do we have? Um, obviously we need to protect what we can and we need to restore what we can and I'm sure you know all that. Um, but I did want to show you one slide, it's one of my favorite graphs, um, um, about another potential solution. Um, so here's, uh, it's by Dr. Jonathan Foley. Um, and so here's a natural ecosystem. So think, you know, something um, humans haven't touched, even though really we've, well, anyways, something um, humans haven't uh, completely modified. Um, and then on this um, spider graph, uh, you have different ecosystem services, so carbon sequestration, um, crop production, forest production. And in this natural ecosystem services, you, you almost maximize all of these ecosystem services, some you know, more than others, um, but you don't provide you know, one of the main ones, i.e. Uh, crop production for feeding humans and um, cattle and um, all those things. In an intensive cropland, uh, we've, you know, through our inputs and obviously industrialization of agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, we're really good at maximizing crop production, or at least trying to. But it's been at the expense of all these other ecosystem services that we knew were present on this landscape and are no longer there. And so what, what Foley and others argue, um, Claire Kremen has a great article that just came out um, not that long ago about working lands. Um, it's this similar concept, uh, but basically we need to find solutions where we have these croplands that have restored or hopefully, you know, somewhat intact ecosystem services. So yes, you have less of those than in the natural ecosystem service, but you have a broader suite of them um, in there. And so we, and you can do this exercise. I do, you know, when I teach um, a little module on urban ecology, I do this exercise in how can we redesign our cities um, to provide multiple ecosystem services rather than just one shelter for us, right? Um, and so I, I think this is a great way to think about the problems that lie ahead. So um, in the next two weeks, um, you will get an introduction into um, multi ways to measure some of these ecosystem services. Um, and in particular, I'll do a module on pollination and Ida will do a module on um, carbon storage um, as well as non-timber timber far forest products. Um, and then I'll also talk briefly about how you can use um, land use land cover maps as, and various metrics within those as proxies for other ecosystem services. Because I mean, you, you all knew, oh, forests provide ecosystem services. So the distance you are to a forest um, and how much forest you have, all of a sudden, you know, you just have to make the case and help people make the link to, hey, if we keep this, um, we'll get all of this in return. Um, and that's a simple metric, but it's an important one and can often, and just needs a land use land cover map. So we'll also uh, learn from Ben um, how to get those and then hopefully try and make those if, if they don't suit your needs. Um, but do you have any questions?